Thank you for joining us today for our first virtual rounds. Uh, please be patient as we work through the new technology. Um, we've missed all you guys and we hope you're all staying safe. So uh, today uh, we're ha we have four speakers. Um, Don Arnold, uh, Des Pernica, Aaron J. Banerjee, and Don Bowdish, and they're all going to give us brief 10-minute talks on their COVID research. Each of the talks will be followed by five minutes of questions. And just to manage the number of questions, um, I've disabled the chat and I would like you to put your questions in the question and answer box because that way we can sort of order, uh, answer them in order. And if your question doesn't get answered in the five minutes, um, the speaker can then uh, provide a text to answer to you. Um, I'm going to record the session uh, and then we will be able to share it afterwards for people who weren't able to make it. Okay, so let me do the introductions. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Don Arnold, who is an associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. He obtained his medical degree from McGill University in 1997 and his master's in clinical epi from McMaster in 2006. His research interests are in platelet disorders with a focus on clinical trials. And he was recently awarded the university's largest grant by the government's COVID Rapid Research Fund for a major study on the use of blood, known as convalescent plasma, from recovered pandemic patients for the treatment of patients fighting the virus. The national study called Conquer One is probably the largest clinical trial of convalescent plasma in the world. And he's going to tell us a bit about that today. Our second speaker will be Des Pernica. Uh, he is a associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, the head of Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease. He joined McMaster in 2009 following his medical school and four-year pediatric residency at Dalhousie and a fellowship in pediatric infectious disease at the University of Ottawa. His research interests relate to the diagnosis and management of respiratory and enteric infections. He is one of three co-principal investigators awarded a grant from the Ontario government's COVID Rapid Response Fund to improve COVID-19 detection in adults and children who lack respiratory symptoms and who are considered asymptomatic or presumed to have recovered from past infection. They will do this by developing a novel diagnostic test to help detect COVID-19 in stool. Our third speaker is Dr. Aaron J. Banerjee. He is an NSERC and Michael G. DeGroote postdoc fellow in Karen Mossman's lab at McMaster, where he studies viruses that emerge in the human wildlife interfaces, such as coronaviruses. He completed his PhD in microbiology from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan, and recently played a critical role on the team that successfully grew SARS-CoV-2, which is enabling current Canadian research into how the virus behaves and how it might be controlled. New funding from CIHR is allowing Dr. Mossman's team to focus on SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis in human and bat cells and to develop in vitro and in vivo infection models. Our final speaker is Don Bowdish. Dr. Bowdish is a professor of pathology and molecular medicine at McMaster. She received her PhD from the University of British Columbia in 2005 and did a postdoc at Oxford. She is a tier two Canada research chair in aging and immunity. And the Weston Family Foundation has recently funded her, Mike Surratt and their collaborators at Mount Sinai to study whether the airway microbiome and early immune responses contribute to COVID-19 infection risks. The foundation has provided uh, funds to the team to determine what percentage of people in the local McMaster community were infected with SARS-CoV-2 by analyzing antibody levels in blood given before the epidemic and comparing it to after the epidemic. So those are our fantastic speakers for today. And I uh, invite... Lori kind of cut out there at the end. Uh, I'm gonna assume the last thing you said was, welcome Donnie Arnold to start off as speakers. <laughs> Is that right? Am I good to go? I think so. I think I just booted myself out. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me just show. Can you um, can you see my slides? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Do I need to do something? 
I might need to share my screen. Okay, one second here. Here we go. Okay. I think you got it. How's that? Is that working? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Lori, and thanks, um, Christy, and everyone for uh, the invitation today. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, I love this rapid fire rounds venue and um, certainly focused around COVID, uh, very timely, of course. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about the Conquer One trial and how we got here. Um, my name is Donnie Arnold. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and uh, the director of the McMaster Center for Transfusion Research. Um, in the next 10 minutes, here's what hopefully I could cover for you briefly. Um, how do we consider antibodies as a treatment? And secondly, is um, the mechanics a little bit around setting up a clinical trial at warp speed? And uh, third, what are, the, what are the challenges that we're facing now um, uh, at the stage that we are currently at? So this is just a quick intro slide to tell you where we're at with uh, COVID-19 infection in Canada. So just over 90,000 um, cases reported in Canada. Certainly Quebec and Ontario are the hot spots. Um, the large kind of wave certainly is subsiding and has mostly subsided, but there certainly are cases that continue to crop up and outbreaks here and there. So this is not over and uh, will be with us for some time. Just in terms of some numbers around disease severity, uh, approximately in Ontario anyways, 10% uh, end up in hospital, 25% of folks who end up in hospital uh, require ICU, and about 30 to 35% of people who are in hospital requiring oxygen um, end up either critically ill in, in ICU or potentially dying. Here's what we're talking about. So this is a coronavirus. It's a novel coronavirus, but there are some features of the coronavirus that are going to be important for you to understand what the biology behind convalescent plasma is. So the coronavirus has a receptor binding domain in the S1 subunit that facilitates viral entry into host cells via the ACE2 surface receptor. So fusion of the membrane with the S2 subunit allows the host to enter the cell, and then cleavage of some of those subunits allows viral RNA to enter the cell and then the virus to replicate. What's key to the immunity of coronavirus and certainly SARS-CoV-2 is the formation of antibodies. And we could measure those in several ways and you'll hear more about this, I suspect, from a few later talks. One is quantitatively by ELISA and the other is functionally by things like a viral neutralization assay. And uh, this lower figure in the, in the, at the bottom is one of those functional assays a plaque reduction assay where when you see virus infecting and killing cells, those are when the plaques appear, those white plaques. If you've eradicated the virus or neutralized the virus, then uh, the plate stays blue and the cells remain intact. So how does that translate into a possible therapeutic? Well, convalescent plasma, which is simply plasma that's been harvested from people who have had the infection, is a rich source of antibodies. And the reason why it might be effective is because it could reduce the viremia as a form of passive immunity, but it may also boost host immunity in an active way in some circumstances. There are potential harms to this. However, one is, at least in theory, this concept of antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. That's when, if the antibodies are to, let's say, the wrong domain or they're non-neutralizing, it could allow other parts of the virus to be more um, pathogenic or, or um, enter the cell a little bit more easily. Um, if we use this therapy, we could potentially attenuate the immune response. In other words, you don't allow the body to make its own antibodies. And thus, people who uh, have the infection and get this treatment may be at risk of getting it again. 
And finally, with the infusion of plasma, there's concern around possible transfusion reactions, uh, which are relatively rare, but in this setting, we worry mostly about things like lung injury. Does it work? Well, there have been a few systematic reviews, at least two published uh, uh, not that long ago, one in 2015 that looked at convalescent plasma as an effective treatment for other, other infections, including influenza, um, SARS-1, and MERS. And this systematic review suggested anyways that uh, there was a potential reduction in mortality, so clinical benefit uh, with this approach. But the studies were low quality, uncontrolled, and of relatively high risk of bias. A more recent systematic review um, published by the group at McMaster, including uh, Gord Guyot and others, um, was focused mostly around influenza, convalescent plasma, or hyperimmune immunoglobulin. There were four randomized trials, and there was little evidence of benefit, uh, but again, the quality of the studies was low. So there certainly was equipoise, and then, um, um, on March 24th, this is when um, things started to happen very, very quickly. And when I first caught word that there may be a clinical trial or some use of plasma brewing in Canada. So that was the first time I attended a meeting where we discussed convalescent plasma in Canada. There were several investigators there, lots of random ideas. Uh, it became clear that Quebec had already begun to develop a protocol. This was a low dose versus high dose versus standard of care. And then um, others had also thought about this and then a group of us got together and had an, an initial protocol that ended up separate from Quebec's that looked a little bit different. But we all recognized that there was no room for um, divisiveness in this uh, climate and somehow we managed to get all of those folks together um, Essentially, there's you now three co-PIs of this very large clinical trial that's going to cover all of Canada, which, which is nothing short of a, of a massive collaborative effort that's been on fast forward. And this is what it looks like. It's the Concor 1 trial. Um, here's really the question. The, the essence of it is going to an answer this. In hospitalized adults with COVID-19 respiratory illness, does COVID-19 convalescent plasma collected from donors who have recovered from COVID-19 infection that contains anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies reduce the risk of intubation or death at 30 days compared to standard of care? This is a large multi-center open label randomized trial. Our intention is to recruit 1,200 patients. 60 sites in Canada are open. That should say three sites in New York, and we've gotten together three blood operators, Canadian Blood Services, Hema Quebec, and the New York Blood Center, all to work together. This is what our site map looks like. It really is quite a phenomenal feat, and this is uh, very ambitious as a timeline, but we're hoping to stay on target. So May 4th, our first patient was randomized we anticipated that by June 7th, we'd have 20 patients. Uh, we're actually ahead of that schedule. And as of yesterday, there were 22 patients randomized on the trial. If all goes well, um, we're hoping that uh, by early 2021, uh, we would have results ready to um, disseminate. Um, some challenges for sure, certainly in this era of the wave, there are dwindling numbers. Um, we're, we're trying to mitigate that by increasing the number of sites if possible and collaborating with consortia in the US and Europe to combine data, even if it may not be complete at the end of the day. And certainly having it available now, the trial available now, it will be um, available for any second wave that might occur. We certainly didn't have time to do a pilot trial, and so there were some uncertainties about estimates of effect and how that will influence our sample size. So at the halfway mark, uh, we've built in an opportunity to re-estimate the sample size. And there's lots of questions that are coming out of this, including what is the active ingredient? Is it measurable by ELISA, or do we need neutralization assays? 
and how will those correlate with clinical outcomes? And hopefully we can answer some of those with the trial data as well. So that's it for me. Um, um, I'm, I'm leaving my email up here because it's possible that I do have to duck out of the hour a little early, but if there are questions that I can't get to in the next five minutes, um, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to correspond with you. Thank you very much. Um, the question, you have a first question from Aaron Jay. Um, it says, recent studies have indicated that the quality of neutralizing antibodies vary in convalescent plasma from recovered patients. Are there plans to test the neutralizing capacity before you use it? And in the absence of a standardized neutralizing assay, how are you going to tell which plasma sample is good enough? Yeah, great question. And uh, we certainly struggled with this as things were opening up very quickly. And it's amazing to work with three different blood operators who have three different ideas for answers for your questions. Um, for example, Hema Quebec will qualify a plasma unit if there's an antibody there, yes or no, by ELISA. Uh, but Canadian Blood Services felt that um, actually we need to test for a neutralizing antibody over a certain titer. And they're using the uh, National Micro Lab to do that assay for them. But you're right, there's no validation, validated test and we could not hold up the trial really to answer that first. So we're collecting all that information, the neutralizing antibody teeters and the ELISA results. And at the end of the day, hopefully we'll be able to answer that when the clinical data is, is available. Mm -hmm. uh, second question from Jerry. Uh, he said, fantastic job pulling this cross country team together. Um, he wants to know, is there a good supply of convalescent serum? And is there any information on the use of just pooled IgG? Yeah, um, so the supply right now in Canada is exclusively for the trial. There is another trial going on in pediatrics, which will be significantly smaller, and a trial going on for more critically ill patients who are in the ICU. Um, but it's not being used off trial right now. There, right now, the 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 difficult the bottleneck is the supply, but that's quickly ramping up. Although there will be a limit to that if the number of recovered patients um, dwindles and um, their antibody levels kind of fall off. So we're in a little bit of a sweet spot right now for the trial, anyways. Um, IgG products certainly have been looked at. Um, that's a little bit of a general approach that all antibodies may be beneficial to combat this infection or cytokine storm. Um, you know, mixed results so far. I think the, the next phase, if convalescent plasma works, would be more of a hyperimmune product where you concentrate down those active antibodies into a lyophilized powder that can be easily kind of uh, administered to patients without relying on, on fresh plasma products. Um, I actually have a quick question related to that. How, how much uh, plasma do you need to use per patient to be confident that it's going to be effective? Um, well, we're using 500 mils as a dose. So either two doses of 250 or one dose of 500. And that's based on previous studies and other infections that have used similar dosing. But your second, the second part of your question is way more important, which is how do you know that's effective? Um, and we don't really. It's, it's a bit of a guess, but and based on what's been done previously, um, we'll have to wait and see how the clinical data turns out. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. I think in interest of time, I'm going to jump to the next speaker. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, just give me a second here. All right, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeff Pernica, and he is going to, I hope, share his screen with us and show us his slides. Okay. Can everybody see that or, and, and hear me? Yes. 
Perfect. Thanks for having me. So uh, today I'll be talking about pediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome or PIMS. PIMS, just the thing for summer. So um, at the very beginning, I think we were all, well, I was happy um, that for once there was a respiratory virus where young children seem to get sick less than adults. A small case series in China seemed to support this. A larger case series in China supported this. A uh, larger bunch of kids in the US. This was all very encouraging such that people really started talking about, you know, do we need to keep school closed, which is, which is a good discussion that, that's still ongoing. Um, and then the shoe dropped with a tweet from the intensivists in the UK on April 26th. This got picked up very rapidly by the media uh, over there. Um, and then unsurprisingly came to our media right after that. And somebody called me and, and asked me what I thought. And in the immortal words of Martha Fulford, we can't change medicine because of something somebody saw on the BBC, right? Like at this point, we had no data. Now, a couple of days after that, there was finally some guidance put out by the Royal College of Pediatrics in Child Health, you know, and talking about a case definition and giving a couple of details, but not much. Two days after that, there was something in CTV because Montreal was actually seeing cases of Kawasaki-like syndrome that, that might be associated with COVID. Um, and then uh, when it hit New York, uh, everything exploded because obviously they had had many more cases than anywhere else on the continent. And that day, okay, the first description of the initial cohort in the UK was published. And so there was finally something for us to read. Now this cluster was eight previously healthy kids who presented to a single center during a period of 10 days. So yeah, this seems like quite a lot for a short um, uh, amount of time. Six of the eight were Afro-Caribbean and they presented with this fever, rash, conjunctivitis, peripheral edema, extremity pain. Now this constellation of symptoms is consistent with uh, a disease entity called Kawasaki disease, which is the most common vasculitis in childhood. All pediatricians know about this. You know, it's been uh, known about for, for decades, right? It happens all the time. We're not sure of the etiology of the syndrome. You know, people have postulated, could it be viral trigger? We don't know, but certainly, it's not unsurprising to get people admitted with this. The difference between this cluster and typical Kawasaki is that a lot of them had abdominal pain and a lot of them were sick. So all of these eight uh, uh, presented in shock without respiratory disease, went to the ICU, had marked abnormally, um, markedly abnormal inflammatory biomarkers, and almost all had big heart problems. One uh, required ECMO and then died. So, you know, uh, you can understand how this, you know, uh, made clinicians in the UK a little bit concerned, but still, you know, at this stage, all we have is a cluster. We don't really know how many cases one would expect besides them saying, ah, it seems abnormal. A week after that first report was a second report. And here finally, okay, were clinicians who went back, looked before COVID to see how many you of these types of Kawasaki-like patients you would expect to compare it to the incidents during uh, the post-COVID period. And you get information like this, which, which I think is very, very useful to suggest that something different actually was happening. Um, now in this cluster, again, 10 patients presenting to a single center similar in size to our own over a month. Five had sort of classic Kawasaki disease, five had hypotension, two had meningeal signs, which is almost never seen in Kawasaki. And again, many of these kids presented with gastrointestinal symptoms and signs. Um, comparing the group ones, the pre-COVID ones, so the group two is the post-COVID, they found that the post-COVID ones were older and they had obviously different blood work. 
So uh, in addition to slightly higher CRPs, they had much lower lymphocyte counts and platelet counts. They had higher ferritins and troponins, and really outcomes were different. So half of them had macrophage activation syndrome, which is a uh, immune dysregulation response often associated with severe disease and poor prognosis. Half of them had shock, and many more of them had abnormal heart tests. These kinds of findings were also seen in an unpublished cohort that is available online as part of a CDC webinar um, in patients that were assessed in San Diego. So what these San Diego people did is looked, uh, found a cluster of these PIMs in orange and compared them to regular Kawasaki's in cyan, to the Kawasaki shock syndromes in yellow, and to uh, toxic shock. So shock syndromes associated with either staphylococcal or streptococcal disease, uh, which we see not uncommonly. And similar to the Italians, the PIMS ones were older, they had lower lymphocyte counts, lower platelet counts, higher CRPs, higher ferritins, and higher troponins. So really, we're getting a picture here of something that could believably be uh, a new syndrome. This report came out a week after the Italian one. And this was, again, a larger cohort on a bunch of children presenting in a time period of interest to 13 hospitals in France and Switzerland with fever, cardiogenic shock, and inflammation. And again, they're older. They're mostly healthy. You know, six out of the 35 were overweight, which I think is pretty standard for uh, the Western world. A lot of gastrointestinal symptoms, a lot of meningismus. Some of the symptoms, the red bold ones, are similar to, to classic Kawasaki. But again, all of these kids had uh, cardiogenic shock. And these were sick. These were the kinds of patients that you wouldn't forget about. You know, there wouldn't be ascertainment bias with this. 80% of them required anotropes, 94% of them were ventilated, more than a quarter went on ECMO. And thankfully, nobody died. So we have this new syndrome. The question, the million dollar question is, is it actually related to COVID or not? Now, if you look at these three case series plus two other published ones that I, I haven't presented, um, a third of these case patients had uh, SARS-CoV-2 detectable by PCR testing of respiratory specimens, and almost 90% uh, were, had positive serology. So obviously there'll be specificity issues, but there'll also be sensitivity issues with serology, and I, I think this seems believable. It's also very interesting to consider the timing of these illnesses. So this is from the Italian cohort. These blue bars are the numbers of case patients, COVID case patients in the region. And if you can see here, the asterisks are when the uh, PIMS cases presented. And there's about a month delay. This information is again from the CDC webinar. It's unpublished data from London showing that the rise in their 30 to 40 odd PIMS cases in London was about a month after the rise in COVID cases in that region. And this is certainly a paradigm that we've seen before. I think a lot of you are gonna remember Entervirus D68, how it arrived to North America in 2014. We got, initially got worried because of a bunch of, of severe respiratory illness, that sort of tailed off. And then a month after that, there was a cluster of kids presenting with acute flaccid paralysis, which, in the intervening six years, enough evidence has accrued to suggest that, you know, EVD-68 was causative of this later uh, 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 reaction. Uh-oh, start my video. Has my vi have my slides been off this whole time? No, just your video. And you're oh, running so I'm, I'm just giving you a time warning. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. So it certainly seems believable that these things could be related. Unsurprisingly, CDC put out an advisory, the Europeans put out an advisory, the WHO put out an advisory, and Canada has. The, this is a slide from um, a CPS webinar last week. The case definitions sort of vary, but they're all looking for the same thing. So we'll hopefully get more of this.
The big question is, will this change anything we're going to do now? I think the eMERGE is looking closer at people who might be presenting with some of these features because nobody wants to send somebody home who's going to go into cardiogenic shock outside of the hospital. A lot of people have been talking about how maybe early referral will, will improve treatment and prognosis, and people are starting a whole bunch of biologics. Obviously, we have no data whatsoever right now as to whether or not this will actually influence outcomes. And that's what I have for today. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is now open for questions. And I will start us off. So you, you mentioned uh, an unusual involvement of macrophages in this syndrome compared to you know, standard Kawasaki's. What, what do you think is the significance of that? So as everyone knows here, I'm not an immunologist. The, 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 it's called, this is a clinical syndrome called macrophage activation syndrome. And from my extremely limited knowledge, okay, it, it has to do with, you know, perforin problems and, and, and other sorts of things. I, I think in, in the context of what I'm talking about, this was a clinical diagnosis. And so, so clinicians such as myself will diagnose this in children with rheumatologic diseases when they have sudden, you know, uh, rises in uh, ferritin, um, drops in, in cell lines, you know, new um, uh fever, things like that. So I, I, I don't think that they actually know what is happening with the macrophages. That's just sort of clinician shorthand. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is going to be very interesting to define, you know, what are actually the immunologic responses in these children, because it could be I mean, we're calling it macrophage activation syndrome, but, but doctors don't know anything. Like the, the, the mechanism uh, for this clinical response could be totally different. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have some questions for you. So from Brian Coombs, uh, are any pre-existing conditions among the patients or uh, any commonality in the use of certain medications? So the thing about all of these case series, and and again, the aggregate is 76, right? It's not as though this is a well-defined syndrome. But the majority of these kids are not, you know, do not have immunodeficiencies or diabetes. That from the from these uh, French Swiss study, the, I mean, the, the most common quote-unquote comorbidity was obesity, and obese children tend to be a lot healthier than obese adults. So uh, it seems. This is something that I, I think um, will hit people that are not, uh, do not have significant pre existing conditions. I think I've forgotten the second half of Brian's question. Oh, maybe I'll just pull up the QA thing. Da, 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 or use of certain meds. Um, from what I know, um, there are no known medication triggers as yet. Uh, but again, we're just learning about this disease. Okay, uh, so from Jerry Wright, I'm just thinking about opening up the schools in September. Is this an augment for serology testing first before schools open? An argument, I think, is yeah. <laughs> an argument um, for serology testing. I, I, the the, the difficult. I, I think the pro. The, the thing that that we all need to remember is that this is still going to be a very very rare kind of uh, syndrome. And uh, I am not sure that something that happens with this frequency should uh, figure prominently into public health planning on, on what to do um, about uh, the schools and whatnot. I mean, I, I think the thing is, is that um, uh, people are gonna get COVID whether or not schools open at some point, we have no idea whether or not vaccination will influence the development of this syndrome, right? If it's, a, if it's a, an autoimmune kind of reaction. And so I think at, at this stage, I don't see this influencing you know, plans for, for reintegration to, to schools. 
Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we are going to move on. You have a couple other questions in the chat box, so if you wouldn't mind just uh, responding to them by text, that would be great. And we will move to our next speaker, who is Aaron J. Banerjee. So let me unmute you. Uh, okay, and you are sharing your screen, perfect. Okay, you can, can you hear me? Good, all right, so I'll dive right into it. We've already heard a lot about um, COVID-19 and, and plasma, and I'll touch upon a little bit of it, but we'll mostly look at isolating the virus and the antiviral responses that we are studying. So when, when COVID-19 or SARS-2 first arrived in Canada end of January, early February, we were putting together a team that could go in isolate the virus to facilitate studies, to develop vaccines, drugs, and basic science. So what we did was we went in and we acquired uh, clinical specimens from some of the first COVID-19 patients that arrived in Canada. And we put those on immunocompromised cells or Vero E6 cells. Now these are African green monkey kidney cells that lack a robust antiviral response. So it makes them an excellent candidate to attempt all sorts of virus isolations. And then we went on to sequence the virus to identify if we had really gotten SARS-2 and how does the virus fit in with, with phylogenetics and where did the virus come from in Canada. So we, we were working with two specimens and um, what you see on your right, specimen one and two, this, this is what Vera cells look like three days post-infection, wipes them out, they're all dead. And we just have mock infected control so we knew bacteria was not killing it. Because patient samples often have all sorts of viruses and other bacteria in it. The next step was when, when you do have cell death, that does not guarantee you've isolated SARS coronavirus too. You could have isolated flu, you could have isolated adenovirus, or this could have been unlikely bacterial because we knew. But it could have been other viruses. So this is where this entire team comes in, uh, Andrew MacArthur's team, Jalice and Amos, and people at Sunnybrook, Patrick and Lily. So we, had, we extracted the genomic content of the virus. We sent it to Patrick and Lily, they sequenced it at Sunnybrook, and then Andrew's team analyzed the sequence. So now we know that the two isolates come from patients that have travel history in Iran. And you see the SARS-CoV-2 SB2 and SB3, these are our isolates. And the isolates that have little red asterisks next to them, they have no known travel history in Iran. So when Andrew's team did this analysis with 1,900 other sequences in the database, we instantly knew that where, where the virus came from. We also did some electron micrographs. Obviously, this was more out of interest. We wanted to see what the virus looked like. And I hope you can appreciate the little amounts of glycoprotein, the spike glycoprotein that you see on top of these viruses. So we again knew this, was, this is very consistent with what you would see with coronaviruses. The next question that we kind of jumped into and what everybody was talking about on social media and people were tweeting and everybody wanted to know if the virus could infect immune cells. Now from work with Middle East respiratory syndrome coronaviruses, we knew that MERS could infect T cells. It would get in, but it wouldn't actively replicate in T cells. So we went in and we tested this question. We got, we had access to uh, human cells through Mario Ostrowski's lab at the University of Toronto. And on this plot, what you see on the y-axis is the amount of virus that is actively replicating and coming out of these cells. What you see on the x-axis is the whole range of uh, cell types that we tested, starting with the African green monkey kidney cells, which was obviously our controls. We knew, we knew the virus propagates in them. Then these are human primary fibroblast cells. They are not susceptible. The virus does not replicate in them. Then we had calutrees, or human lung epithelial cells, again, as expected the virus does replicate in these cells. And these cells have now become the gold standard for a whole bunch of studies with uh, SARS coronavirus too. We then used uh, immune cell lines, so monocyte lines, macrophage lines that were derived from these lines, as well as derived dendritic cells. And none of these supported active propagation of SARS coronavirus too. And more promisingly, we also looked at primary blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and we looked at CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, CD19 inter B cells, uh, monocytes, and everything else that didn't fit this criteria. And the virus does not actively propagate in these cells, so which is, which is very promising. 
But having said that, we knew that MERS could get into these cells but not come out of these cells. So it's a susceptibility issue which the virus could overcome and get in, but the virus and cell types were not permissive for virus replication. So we wanted to test that question as well. So we went in and we stained these cells post-infection. And this, this was very early days. We didn't have defined antibodies. So we made our own cocktail of antibodies. We used uh, serum from COVID-19 patients. We also used some very uh, early antibodies that were being developed and we established a cocktail to test these cells. So as you can see, Vero E6 cells, the monkey kidney cells, stain very bright and green. And of all the cells we tested, we did find few cells in, um, amongst the city for T cell population that does stain for SARS coronavirus too. And we also confirmed this by electron microscopy. So we do know that uh, CD4 plus T cells do get infected, but for some reason, they, the replication of the virus is reported and the virus does not come out of these cells. We still don't know what the virus really does and how the cell deals with the virus, just, we, we have no idea yet. So jumping on to the next, uh, the next little project that we're working on is looking at how the virus replicates in human cells and how do human cells mount an immune response to SARS coronavirus 2. Now coronavirus replication is just a little complicated. It's not, it's unlike any other positive sense RNA, single stranded RNA virus. The virus makes subgenomic RNA then makes uh, transcripts which then gets translated. So what, what, the, what we were trying to do here is do a time series RNA-seq analysis. So we infected human lung epithelial cells and we got RNA out of these cells at zero hours post-infection, one, two, three, six, and 12 hours post-infection. And I hope you can appreciate that the virus, you start seeing more transcripts towards your right. So the virus genome is five prime and three prime in this direction with ORF1, AB. All the non-structural proteins are at the five prime end all your structural proteins and accessory proteins are at the three prime end. And the, what the virus has evolved to do is it, it, translate, it transcribes all the three prime end stuff first. So you get a lot more of your structural proteins and you also get a lot more of your accessory proteins. Now for coronaviruses, structural and accessory proteins modulate human immune responses. So it makes sense for the virus to transcribe and translate those first before you have other proteins. And we see that with SARS coronavirus too. It's, it's very consistent with what MERS and SARS-1 would do. Now, if you look at coronavirus infections or any virus infections, when a virus infects human cells, our cells produce antiviral interferons. Now, these interferons act on infected cells and neighboring cells to produce antiviral interferon stimulated genes. Now, these are protective and in theory should protect our neighboring cells from subsequent infection. But from our studies, we and others have shown that coronaviruses like MERS and SARS can block these responses. So anti interferon production is blocked and subsequently downstream production of antiviral interferon stimulated genes are also blocked. So this was obviously a question we really wanted to know, how effective is SARS coronavirus to in blocking these immune responses? So we've done a lot of studies, but in the interest of time, I'll just show you one plot this is again the time series RNA-seq analysis. The top bar tells you about the time points post-infection and everything in blue here. The second bar tells you about the infection status. This is mock infected and this is SARS coronavirus 2 infected. And at 12 hours post-infection, we do see an induction of interferon and interferon signaling associated products. So the virus is stimulating interferons. It is stimulating the production of interferon stimulated genes. So we've now gone on and we've done more studies. We've done pre-stimulation studies. We've done post-stimulation studies. And in summary, what our data is really telling us, SARS coronavirus 2 is not very efficient in shutting down interferon production. And neither is it as efficient as MERS and SARS-1 in shutting down downstream interferon stimulated gene production. Now this is very promising in terms of a whole bunch of treatments, including the use of interferon beta as a treatment cocktail which is being tested as a, in clinical trials by Stanford. So I think I'll just stop here for today. I do want to acknowledge, a, this was a huge team effort. We had people from Sunnybrook, uh, McMaster, and U of T. I got exceptional support from IITR, including Jerry and Andrew. Andrew once told me when I first was jumping onto this project, anything you need, just ask and you'll have it. So really, we went in very strong and we were able to do all the science. 
and also amazing institutional, logistical, and funding support from some of the top institutions in Canada. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open for questions now. And I will start off. So, when you do these um, types of isolation studies, do you get the less virulent coronaviruses as well? Yes, yeah, so that is a possibility of isolating other coronaviruses and not just SARS-2. But we did work with patient samples that were negative for a panel of respiratory viruses. So the diagnostic teams at Sunnybrook had tested them and we only picked samples that were negative, or as far as the diagnostics go, negative for everything else. And have you, have you identified any cell types that don't produce ACE2 that can be infected? Not yet. Like, we know cells that cannot be infected, we just haven't tested if they express ACE2 or not. Okay, a question from Jerry. Uh, I'm curious about this weak anti antiviral effect. Any thoughts on the mechanism compared to SARS? Yeah, so I haven't, we haven't particularly looked at the difference between SARS-1 and SARS-2. But uh, Vineet's group is looking at uh, differences between certain proteins that we do know modulate innate immune responses. For example, there are proteins in SARS-1 that have been studied and we know it blocks interferon production. Now, the homologs of those proteins are different in SARS-2. Now, functional studies have not been done yet, but at least at the sequence level, they're slightly different. So I don't know what that means when it comes to functional uh, aspects of it. Okay, a question from Brian. Uh, with a robust ISG response induced, where does host defense fall down in infected cells? Yeah, I, I wouldn't know. This is, uh, we do see ISGs, but are, are these ISGs potent enough to block virus replication? We don't know. We'll have to do those studies. Okay. Uh, a question from Amy Gilgrass. Do you think the non-productive infection of T cells is leading to lymphopenia? And do you see infection of T cells in vivo? So uh, T cell infections in vivo, not that I know of, but we did the study because somebody else had published using a T cell line that the virus gets in and there was a whole bunch of debate on uh, what about primary cells? How relevant is it for ex vivo studies? And it's, it's also tricky in vivo because think about this. We are taking a lot of T cells and we are forcing a lot of virus on it. Catching that in, a, in an in vivo setting is a lot more trickier than just, just forcing infection on a whole bunch of T cells. You have to get the timing right. You have to get the timing of infection right if you're doing in vivo experiments. So um, I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if we can do that, but maybe. And first part of the question, most coronavirus does infect T cells and induce apoptosis. But uh, we, we are being cautious about making that statement because we haven't really assessed that for SARS coronavirus too. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see that's all of the questions that have come in. If people still have questions, they can uh, still type them and you can answer them by text. Um, in the meantime, we will move to our final speaker, who is Dr. Don Bowdish. I'm going to unmute you because you are muted. There we go. And you can see my screen. I can. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, great. I'm going to talk real fast to keep us on time. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the unusual features of the immunology of this disease and how it might or might not uh, help us ability. So this virus is an odd one because it doesn't follow the rules. The rules for a new virus, which nobody has an immunity for, is that the curve of infection should look like this. We should have lots of infections in young people, we should have lots of infection in older adults, and we should have a period of protection in the middle. Now let me show you what the curves actually look like for this virus. So in Canada, this is uh, our data as of the 26th of May, and what you can see is we have very poor data on children, uh, but we definitely see that there's this peak of infections in middle age. This huge proportion of cases in the over 80 crowd is really part of our deep shame as a country because the Canadian epidemic has been really predominated by long-term care homes 
And in other countries that have better preventative measures, this peak isn't nearly so high. Until recently, we had uh, paucity of testing, and we weren't able to test people who were presumed positive, but uh, may not have hit the criteria. Let's look at a country who's done very extensive testing. So Iceland has done enough testing that they've essentially tested everyone on the country more than once to, to really model spread and asymptomatic spread. And they probably have the best data. And take a look at what that curve looks like. It's the exact opposite of what immunologically a new virus should look like. And there are very low uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic infections in the young and actually comparatively low in older adults as well. And the majority of infections are occurring in this middle group of, of people here. So why does this strike right into the hearts of an immunologist? It's because in this typical curve here, we can explain why people are or are not getting sick. Children are immunologically naive. They don't have any background immunity. They don't have any related exposures that they can apply to this virus. And so they should be the ones who are getting sick when a new virus enters uh, the system. The older adult population is, has two compounding factors. They have this concept of immune senescence, which means that their immune system has been remodeled in such a way that oftentimes it ineffectively responds to novel pathogens. And they also have the increase in comorbidities. And in a disease like this, which is clearly a multi-system, multi-organ disease, uh, at least some of that susceptibility is due to this sort of pattern. And if we look at what the uh, Icelandic curves look like, what we're seeing is the majority of infections, asymptomatic or symptomatic, are occurring in people who are in the prime of their immunological lives. SARS-2, GOV-2 does not follow what we call the rules. So pick any lung infection you like, influenza, bacterial pneumonia, and there is a set of rules that the immune system follows. Signals hit the bone marrow, and these can be cytokines, they can be bacterial products, and the bone marrow mobilizes innate immune cells, neutrophils, monocytes, and sometimes immature neutrophils. It does this because the concept is to get these cells up quickly and get them to the lungs where they can deal with the infection. So what should be happening is when we look in the blood of people who are suffering from a serious lung infection, we should see that there's an increase in the number of neutrophils and really no effect on the absolute numbers of B or T cells. We should also see that the lungs of these people are full of neutrophils and because they release cytokines that increase permeability, the amount of neutrophils and monocytes in there should be proportionate to the amount of edema or liquid in the lungs. And this is absolutely positively 100% not the case in people who have SARS-CoV-2. What we see and what uh, does refer to is that we actually see that there's a decrease in circulating lymphocytes, so T cells and B cells, and we can partition people based on how severe their infection is. So the people who have very, very severe infections have a decrease. They have a loss of their circulating T cells, and people who survive uh, will have a slightly higher numbers. There's also some very good data saying that there's a loss of xenophils. And so where are these T cells going? Well, it looks like in the circulation, there are two things happening. It doesn't appear that they're being infected directly. There's no signs that those circulating T cells are uh, dying of a viral infection. There is one uh, study looking at uh, spleens and lymph nodes from people who died of SARS-CoV-2, and they find that, in fact, there's evidence that um, macrophage lymphocyte interactions are such that the high cytokine load is causing those T cells to die in the lymph nodes and the spleens. That in itself is, is problematic if it shows up to be true, but in truth, one of the most disturbing things is that these T cells uh, may be ending up in the lungs. We think that the relationship between the cytokine storm and these strange changes in T cells are um, uh, due in part to the presence of high levels of IL-6. Lymphocytes are very sensitive to this and will undergo apoptosis. And there does seem to be sort of a relationship between the amount of cytokines and how many of these T cells seem to be dying. But like I said, one of the worrisome aspects is it looks like one of the reasons we're losing these cells in the circulation is they're going to the organs. And this, again, is not what's supposed to happen. T cells are supposed to have very 
uh, specific responses. And some of the studies looking at the immunology of these cells look like they're broadly and robustly activated. And so it's believed that these T cells leaving the circulation, entering the lungs and other organs are contributing to the pathology. This is not something that's really ever been seen before in the context of, uh, of a, a lung infection. And let's talk about why would those T cells go where they're not wanted? Why are they going to a party where they don't belong? And to do this, I'll give you the very basic primers of your, your antibody responses first. So in all our immunology textbooks, what we'll teach you is that when you encounter a new pathogen for the first time, you're going to make IgM antibodies. These are big antibodies, not very specific, almost never associated with pathology. Then you'll have a slightly higher affinity IgG antibody. These are generally considered to be neutralizing and protecting in many infections, can cause pathology in some cases. And then of course you'll have your IgA antibodies which coat your mucosal surfaces, tend to be very high affinity. And the order that these antibodies are supposed to be made is MgA. And there should be an increasing rate of specificity. This is what every theoretical textbook is going to show you. Your IgMs, you get your IgAgs, your IgAs. There's a very prescriptive number of days for each of these infections. Um, and if you have good neutralizing antibodies, you should see the amount of virus go low. If you if your antibodies you're making are not effective, they shouldn't be proportionate to the to the viral load. In practice, what do we actually see? Well, we do see that uh, there is some reduction in, in people who, with their viral load if they recover. So here we're looking at severe patients in red and blue um, in uh, or the less severe. We do see that the virus goes down. But if we look at those antibody responses between the severe cases and the mild cases, there's really no proportionate um, uh, between the amounts of antibodies uh, and the severity of the case. And so uh, both uh, Donnie and Aaron J refer to this in the context of their talks. Uh, it appears that though not every antibody, even the ones that are made against the quote unquote right epitopes are not protective. However, there is a, a statistically significant increase. The curve shifts to the left for people with severe cases. So they seem to have earlier antibody responses. I'll tell you what this means in two slides. So in practice, what we actually see is we don't see the rules followed. We don't see the IgM, IgG, IgA rules. We see that IgA level more obvious in the saliva where uh, mucosal IgG antibodies are. So how are we getting the last antibody first? And furthermore, worryingly, what we find is that there is definitely a correlation, two studies have found now, that people who have the most IgA antibodies have the worst outcome. IgG and IgM are not associated with outcomes. Why are people having this one come up first? Well, the answer is it looks very much like it's a memory response. It's indicating that people have seen something that happens earlier in this contributes to the pathology. So T cells, as an example, uh, there's been a study here that's shown that even people who are unexposed, about 30%, 40% of people already have pre-existing T cell immune responses to seasonal coronaviruses. And this, I think, is one of the things that helps explain the reverse of our U-shaped curve. Those children don't have this previous exposure. They're protected from a lot of the immune pathology because they don't have these pre-existing and what look like pathological responses. And in Dez's talk, you'll notice that he used one month is when these infections come up. And guess how long it takes to make one of those really strong IgA memory responses one month. So I think there might be a bit of a clue there. Uh, there's also some evidence that um, a lot of our airway infections in nursing homes and long-term care facilities are coronavirus mediated, much higher than the regular population. We can talk about that in the discussion period. So what are we doing? Well, um, we are doing a few different things. We are working with the group in, in Sinai and our local investigators here and Mike Surratt and I have got a, a grant to create a Hamilton serial prevalence cohort where we'll be able to look at the presence of some of these antibodies and cross uh, reactive antibodies. Jess Wallace here is no longer picking up plates, she's picking up a phone and she's calling and recruiting people and Braden's helping developing some of these uh, seasonal coronavirus antibody assays. <laughs> 
And we're also doing a household transmission study with uh, the group in Sinai, looking at infected healthcare workers and measuring local mucosal immune reactions and the, the composition of the microbiome in their household members to try to determine if we can figure out both the age and also the immune and microbiome factors that push you towards the asymptomatic or symptomatic infection. Don, I'm just giving you your two minute warning. Okay, good. Um, and then the last thing we're doing is trying to characterize some of these immune responses. Uh, to, and this is work done by Allison in the lab, who's looking at the, how the aging of the immune system might tailor this immune response, looking at uh, interactions between comorbidities and drugs and differences between symptomatic and asymptomatic people. So that very, very quickly is our group. And, uh, and I just want to acknowledge the Surrett Lab, uh, the Weston Family Foundation for giving us the money to start these studies, and the team which thought they were going to get a break during this uh, downtime, but instead have been working frantically to get these studies up and running. Love to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. That's going to be super interesting. Uh, who knew that you were, you were going to rewrite the textbooks with this virus? <laughs> Um, I, I have a quick question for you. With the seasonal coronaviruses, um, has anyone looked to see if the antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 uh, recognize those seasonal coronaviruses? Yeah, so I'm on a serology working group, and it kind of depends on which epitope you're looking at. So a lot of the commercial assays, uh, all the different commercial people, they all have different sort of epitopes that they're looking at. And certainly IgAs are the most cross-reactive for sure. And it looks like the earlier in the infection you catch them, the more cross-reactive they are. But they do seem to cross-react to a lot of things. The problem with the seasonal coronaviruses is until now, nobody thought they were very interested. So we can't get saliva. There's no one in this country who's got saliva from verified seasonal coronavirus. Um, and even getting the serum has been really, really challenging. So the validation for a lot of the seasonals is not where it needs to be, really. We're definitely seeing a lot of cross-reactivity towards MERS and SARS, and actually a few other envelope viruses with those IGAs. So the real focus of the serology working group right now is, um, is uh, really working to find epitopes which are not cross-reactive, so we can truly distinguish those. But certainly those IGAs are not the high affinity antibodies we normally would expect. Great, thank you. Okay, first question from Aaron J. Has mucosal immunity been correlated with clearance of virus in nasal tissue? Uh, no, it's hard to get nasal tissue from live people. Um, so a lot of the studies have to be um, sort of done uh, post-mortem, and then of course you only have severe deaths. So one of the things that the group in the, um, uh, the Sinai group and other groups in Toronto are looking at is using a saliva as a matrix, so something we can sample easily. And we're doing um, nasal secretions uh, uh, to look at correlates of protection there, but I wouldn't say there's a definitive um, there's a definitive response to that. Okay, second question is from Eric Brown. He says, lovely talk for a non-expert like me and terrifying. What's this mean for a potential vaccine? I get cold, sweaty palms when I think about some of the vaccine strategies. I think you know, Donnie's Arnold's trial is going to tell us definitively, and I hope and pray for his success, because as immunologists, we're pretty good at making antibody-based vaccine. If you tell us what bit of the protein can be made, we can do that. But the parallel here is the HIV vaccine. So HIV, people with HIV have tons of antibodies. We can make tons of antibodies to different HIV protein. They do not protect whatsoever. So the concern is, and one of the things that uh, Allison's working on is T cell correlates of protection. We might need T cells to go in there and kill virus infected cells. We're very bad at making those. And I think there is a real and present concern that we may have some enhancing effects. So are Des's kids, were they immunized by seeing the virus once and then did they get ill because of that? This is something that uh, everyone who's in the vaccine field is paying very close attention to. Okay, thanks. Um, third question is from Mike Surratt. Can we pre-screen individuals for this potential memory IgA response? I think so. So the problem is getting pre-COVID sera now. So right now it's a little bit challenging because 
one of the reasons we got funding for our study is we happen to have a whole bunch of big serum. So we'll be able to definitively say, these people gave blood before SARS-CoV-2 existed. So we can look at that. And as the ELISAs and the screening gets better and better and better, we'll be able to say more definitively, these are responses exclusive. I would say the reagents right now are just at the cusp of where we can do that really reliably. There's a little bit too much cross-reactivity. Um, a question, is this, is there still this memory IgA response in coronavirus in young or naive individuals? So, uh, good question. Naive, uh, young, no, we don't know. We just plain old don't know. And if, if anyone could get me some discarded blood from children, it would be really great to look at it. Um, because the, the, we could look at the antibodies in there. In the naive individuals, yes. So for IgA, there are, there's a group in Toronto who's going to present some data next week saying that they found cross-reactive antibodies in about 30 to 40% of the population. So again, really mimicking the T-cell paper that I showed you. Um, and so yes, there are cross-reactive. And then it looks like in the context of your SARS-CoV-2 infection, you, you are also stimulating uh, new immune reaction to make more specific antibodies. So by the time we get someone's blood, there's sort of a mix of those earlier pre-existing antibodies that were lower affinity and like the, the new antibodies that were made in the context of the infection. So it's gonna get a little bit complicated, but I'm pretty confident that, that as the reagents improve, we'll be able to distinguish those two things. Great. Um, well, that's the end of our webinar. Uh, I want to thank all of the speakers for their fantastic talks and uh, thank the audience for coming and hopefully we'll do this again. Thanks everybody.